Good morning or good afternoon. Welcome to Beginning Steps to Integrate AAC in the Classroom. Um, I'm Megan Conover and um, before I begin I wanted to um, go over some housekeeping tips or um, pieces that I need to. Um, <clears throat> all right, uh, so the first piece is uh, just pre presenter information. Um, so this pre presentation will focus exclusively on Sotillo products and applications and will not include information regarding other similar or related products or applications. Um, disclosures, um, financial, I am contracted by Sotillo Corporation. Non-financial, I receive Sotillo loaner devices to use in my trainings and presentations and I am a member of Isaac. All right. Um, and then I just wanted to go through, for those that aren't familiar with um, <clears throat> GoToMeeting, or webinar. Um, so if you wanted to um, shrink the control panel or expand it, you can use that orange arrow. So depending on which operating system you have, whether it's a Windows or a Mac, um, you'll see the examples over on the right hand side there. You are all muted for this presentation. Kim Gallant is on the call and she will be answering questions. Um, and then if there's something she um, needs me to answer, she'll interject. Um, and let me know. Um, and I, I do have spots throughout the presentation for questions to come up. Um, I'll be honest that there's a lot of content for this training, so often um, I kind of go through pretty quickly. So um, there is a t the time at the end, especially if you want to stay on uh, for a few minutes longer for me to answer questions. Um, the mo materials are located um, in the material section of the control panel where you, you, I think it says handouts or materials, I guess, um, and that's how you can download them. And then Kim will also be sending out a follow-up email. Um, all right, so let's begin then. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to give you some information about me. Um, so I am an AAC consultant for Sotelo in Colorado, and I'm also the language coordinator for the company. Um, so what the, the language coordinator piece means is that I am in charge of all the vocabulary files that we have on our systems, um, both on TouchChat and on NovaChat and ChatFusion. Um, <clears throat> so I've actually been a consultant for the past 15 years in Colorado, and I've been the language coordinator for almost eight, eight years. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions about either if you have follow-up questions um, at the end. <clears throat> All right, so Kim is going to put up a poll. I want to get a feel for who is on this call um, today. So if you can fill out the poll and then we'll, I can ha I have a better idea. Okay. It looks like we have 71% voted. <clears throat> All right, so it looks like we have um, most people are speech pathologists or speech assistants. Um, we have a parent or two and um, AAC consultant or AT specialist. Thank you so much for doing that. It's great to have you all here. And it's, um, I think this training, what I've tried to do over the years is really um, develop it for everybody. Um, <clears throat> so in saying that, um, you know, one of the things I like to say up front, especially for the speech pathologists on the call, a lot of this information um, is out there in our, in the field of AAC and, and for the AAC consultants um, as well. Um, so it's not that it's rocket science, um, it's kind of a perspective on how you look at it. So I'll explain that a little bit more as I go over the agenda. Um, so this is what I'll go over in the next hour. Um, I'm gonna talk about modeling, but I tell you 15 years ago, what I used to say to people is in my trainings, you need to model and then I would move on. And it left people not knowing what to do. So I spent a good 15 minutes talking about modeling and trying to break it down and give um, video examples so people walk away really understanding what modeling is meant to be. Um, there's, there's a real spectrum as far as understanding it versus being able to be fluent in it. Um, so I always try to get people at least starting to model a little bit and, and again we'll talk about that more. I like to talk about core vocabulary. It's a term that's thrown around a lot in our field um, but it's not always um, 
defined very very well or in layperson's terms. So I like to define it. So again, for those speech pathologists on the call, this is no, not new information for you, but it's great information to take away so that you can train your um, the communication partners you're working with, whether it be parents or um, school teams, um, OTs, PTs, that, that sort of thing. Um, and then I like to go over a little bit of the structure of word power. Word power is one of our most robust vocabulary files. And I think if you have a couple tips and tricks up your sleeve, then it makes it much easier to understand and also to teach. <clears throat> and then the final piece is literacy. And this is my way to try to combine the academic piece with AEC. My experience has been that it's much easier to pull someone out and work one-on-one -on -one with them with an augmentative communication device, but as soon as that child goes back into the classroom, that's where some of the breakdown happens. So these are some of the things I've seen that work over, you know, through the clinicians I've worked with, um, particular, uh, one in particular that I'm going to talk about. So then you notice at the bottom, it says, as they relate to the communication partner. So the communication partner is everybody but the person using the communication device. And I think <clears throat> so often we do focus on the, uh, the person using the device, obviously. Um, but the communication partner plays a really important role in all these aspects. And if that person or persons don't understand what it is they're supposed to be doing, then um, everything kind of falls apart and and the person using the device kind of follows along with that adult that's supposed to be instructing them um, so that's the intent of um, the training today all right <clears throat> so really what i try to do again because i've been doing this for so long um, i used to come in in the beginning and try to come up with 20 steps that you can do um, that will make um, make yourselves successful. What I learned quickly was that um, that's not really easy for teachers or paraprofessionals to do, or even parents, right? Um, if it's something that's not very natural uh, in your day-to-day -day life, then it's probably not going to happen, uh, at least over the extended period of time that needs to happen uh, to help your student or child. And then the other piece um, <clears throat> So I, I did present a lot to speech language pathologists. That was kind of my, um, in the beginning, was my core um, population. Um, but I also started to recognize that the people that were spending the most amount of time with students on AAC devices um, were not the SLP. And um, they, they didn't always have all the necessary information to support them properly. And this was kind of a huge uh, awakening when I realized I wasn't really, uh, my trainings weren't geared to those people so that, the terminology and the trainings um, was understandable. So what I like to start doing, and this is, I do this uh, training quite a bit live. I do it for school teams. Um, <clears throat> I do it on a bigger, bigger stage as well. Um, but it's, I think it's really important to get people thinking about what these devices are like um, for somebody. So this next activity um, is obviously you're going to do it in your chair at home in front of your computer. Um, so you're going to see a direction on your screen, and I'll show you what this looks like. And it's, it's, um, it has no text, as you can see. It's all in symbols. So I'm going to give you about 30 seconds, and I want you to try to follow that direction. So it might be stand up, um, stomp your foot three times. Um, so just take a look and see if you can figure it out, and just go ahead and do it. If you just joined me, I just saw somebody else uh, come on. We're doing an activity right now. Um, right, you'll see on the screen, um, there's no text. Uh, the direction is in symbols. So if you can try to figure out what that direction is telling you to do. Okay, so my when I do this live, I would say um, one out of 20 people will get what the direction means. Okay, so I'm going to show you, give you a little hint. So I'm assuming that might be the case. So here's your hint to help you figure out what this direction is. So as you can see, it's in Mandarin. 
<clears throat> so unless you're 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 a fluent speaker of Mandarin, this probably isn't going to help you too much. All right, so I'm going to show you what I intended the message to mean. <clears throat> Put your hand on top of your head. All right, here's the thing though. Um, if one of you were to have designed this activity, I think we can all agree that these symbols don't necessarily mean that specific word. So put that image, it doesn't necessarily mean put, it can mean all kinds of different things. And if you were to have designed the same activity with a different direction, <clears throat> it would look entirely different. So symbols are really abstract unless we actually apply that meaning. So for kids to get communication devices, this is what the device looks like to them. Most of the time they're not literate and they have no idea what we intend those images to mean. And so it's often put right in front of them um, and they have no idea what to do. And what happens from our end as the communication partner is, and often as the adult um, is that we're all literate. So whether we realize it or not, we're reading those words below the image. And so we presume that these images have a lot more meaning than they actually do. And so if you think of it in this term, these terms, right? You're all very smart, intelligent people. Uh, and, and if, you know, I'm assuming most of you couldn't figure it out, um, doesn't mean you're not intelligent and you don't have language skills. It just means you didn't understand what was supposed to happen. All right, so <clears throat> think about what that experience felt like for you. Um, did you feel overly successful? Oftentimes in our culture, we're asked to do something. And um, if we don't achieve that goal, we don't feel very, un we don't feel very successful. This is what happens to kids that are nonverbal all day, every day. Okay, they, they don't have the expressive and receptive communication to understand what's happening. And um, so they're often kind of, ha kind of having these failed attempts. So it doesn't feel very good. Um, so I guess the important piece is we really need to teach kids what these um, symbols are supposed to mean. If we don't teach them, then they will never learn. And the same with the literacy part. You know, if they don't understand what that word means, we need to get them to a point where they do. Okay, so we're going to get into modeling. <clears throat> so I always like to give a formal definition of modeling and then to kind of break it down. So this is just a dictionary definition of model. A system or thing used as an example to follow or imitate. So it's fairly straightforward. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one of the easiest ways to, sh to talk about modeling is through um, showing a video. So I'm going to show what happens with a 23-month-old talking to his mom, uh, and they are both verbal, and you'll just, I want you to kind of get a visual of what that looks like. So I apologize, this um, video, the audio is not, not fantastic, but there are captions for what the child is saying, so hopefully you don't have any trouble hearing it, but I apologize. Um, it's I've got the loudest volume, and I just haven't been able to make it work on this computer very well. Does that look familiar to anyone, <clears throat> whether it's your own child or niece or nephew, grandkids, um, neighbors? 
really modeling is talking to somebody. Uh, and when they don't have um, the full English language or whatever language it is they're speaking, then you're modeling, you're providing an example. So you can imagine um, this little boy when he's six months old, would he be getting out that same kind of vocabulary? No, we wouldn't expect that, right? Maybe some sounds, ba ba ba, um, and and uh, a variety of other ones, right? Um, and his ability to get those sounds out in the first six months is because he's had people that were giving him an example of what language looks like. And we know from research that um, kids that are never spoken to don't develop language, okay? <clears throat> so that's what modeling looks like. So um, this is from Gail Porter. So the, the whole idea is in the first person in the equation, we have probably mom and dad plus the 23 month old, okay? And that equals two people um, speaking verbally, okay? They're communicating through verbal speech. All right, so let's look at another language. So this next video you're going to see are um, two boys, a three-year-old and a 17-month-old. Um, they will be uh, verbally speaking, but they're also signing. So I want you to take a look at what this looks like. Um, <clears throat> oops. All right, so you can see, <clears throat> you know, sign language is great because it's so visual as you're going along and you can see um, how the little brother is really trying to get that dog sign, trying to get under the blankets to get that dog sign. So he truly is imitating what his brother is doing. Sometimes you can see that he's actually learned a word and um, he's he's signing it instead of in front of, um, before his brother does. So that just gives you an idea of, of where he is. So 17 month old using these signs, um, and how they progress. So the same equation exists. So we've got, in the first part of the equation, we've got the older brother and probably the mom and dad, both, all three signing to the 17 month old as the second part of the equation. And that equals, you know, multiple people signing or communicating through sign language, all right? So what if we crossed out the first part of the equation? So the mom, the dad, the older brother, if they did not sign to that little guy, would he learn sign language, okay? And the answer is no, it's what we know about language. If there's nobody there to model, to imitate, then people don't learn the language. And it's very easy to, to think about in sign language. Um, it's very concrete, okay? So <clears throat> this is what happens with kids on communication devices. Um, we have usually an adult that's verbally speaking as the first part of the equation. And then we have a child trying to use a communication device and express themselves with that. And it leads to a lot of confusion. And really it's simple, it's, they're not speaking the same language. How can we expect someone that can't imitate us verbally to, to understand verbal communication? You know, it's, it's kind of laughable when we think about language and what we know about it. Um, 
<clears throat> even for lay people that don't have a background in speech pathology, right? Um, we understand that we're not going to learn sign language if, if nobody's going to sign to us. Well, the same thing exists for AAC devices. Um, so <clears throat> I guess the question is, what can we do about it? I would say this is the single most important thing we can do. If we can start changing that first part of the equation so that the adults around the child are actually using the communication more than that child, we're going to see progress. Um, so there's two way, two things that I um, um, talk about in this training um, that can that can help. So the first part is modeling with that expectation, and I'm going to show you what that looks like. Um, it's basically um, talking to somebody without expecting them to answer. Okay, and then the second part is using um, literacy in a structured activity, um, and we'll get into more detail about that. <clears throat> All right, so this um, video is a mom, and you'll see she's got her own communication device. It happens to be an iPad um, with touch chat on it, and um, her son has um, his own iPad as well. Um, <clears throat> so they're going to be playing with Goop, and what you'll hear is the mom will verbally speak, but she'll support what she's saying on the device, and she probably she doesn't ever use more than two words, I don't think. Um, during it. So you'll see her use the device for two word phrases, but but a lot of single words as well. So she's supporting what she's saying verbally. Um, so I just want you to take a look. Okay, so before I go forward, I'm going <clears> to <throat> answer the, um, a question that I often get. Um, uh, people ask, well, this mom has her own communication device. How are we expected to model if we don't have a secondary device? So there's a, there's a few things that can be done. Um, I think, you know, probably the most basic is <clears throat> if you only have that child's device, then the conversation needs to happen amongst the team, whoever's involved, as well as with that um, person or child to say, look, we want to be communicating with you more, so we're going to be using your device. And I understand there are, you know, you know, there's probably, you know, a five to ten percent of kids that will not, you know, be willing to share their device. So I understand that could be an issue for sure. But I would say for the most part, um, if kids are told what is going to happen and um, nobody grabs their device away from them, there's always kind of the, the those boundaries that are put in place, then it can work quite well. Um, more and more school districts do have iPads to help support, um, but we also have um, low-tech boards. They're available on our website, um, and they are free, so you could have a low-tech board that you use to model. And in addition, the chat editor software is a free download that can work on uh, a smart board or Promethea board. Um, and I'm going to talk about that more, and you're going to see an example how that works. Um, and that's a way to have it in the classroom um, as a as a device for everybody to use. Um, so hopefully that answers that if you had those questions. <clears throat> All right, so during this video, um, how often does this child use this device? 
and it's it's not once, right? It, it goes on for over seven minutes and not one time does he use the device. Um, so here's the piece to that. Um, you know, we don't know how long he's had his device. It could have been a week, it could be two years, it could be four years. Maybe his mom just learned about modeling and she just started doing it today. Um, so when we look at, again, going back to that early language development, if you look at a baby from zero to six months, so you have a baby six months old, you've been talking to it, other people have been talking to your baby for six months, and they don't come out with the words, hey mom, how's it going today, right? Because they've been working on for that for six months, their expectation would be that they should have those words, okay? So when you hear that, you realize how ridiculous it is. And, and so that's often what happens with kids, um, especially when they're older, say nine or 10, the expectation is that they understand more language. And, and chances are they do. A lot of these kids are really smart and they learn even though they don't have a, a way to express themselves. Um, but if nobody's been talking to them, really our expectation should be, this is like a, a one day old infant, right? We don't have, the expectation shouldn't be that they come out with all these phrases. So we need to model, we need to model as much as possible. So also is the focus on playing with Goop and being with mom? And the answer is yes. And is he enjoying the activity? Um, and the answer is yes. And I would say after, you know, when a child first gets a communication device, I would say the first two weeks, they're really engaged um, <clears throat> because they often think there's games. Um, they recognize a lot of the Sotelo devices as, I, as tablets. Um, so after about two weeks, uh, their interest starts to wane um, unless they have a reason to be interested in using it. Okay, so once the idea is there's no games, um, then what do they do with it? And so that's okay. We don't want the focus to be on the communication device, right? We want that child to be interested in playing with Goop. And I always compare it to articulation therapy. So I used to do this um, years ago. So you'd have a child that co come into your um, therapy room and they're working on the S sound or the R sound, right? They didn't care that your tongue goes to the roof of your mouth behind your teeth to make the S sound. What they care about is playing the game, and that's why they're there to invest and 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 why they want to come back every week. And that's why it's so important for a speech therapist to to have those games and those activities to do. All right. It's the same thing with AAC devices. Until that child actually recognizes that this device does something for them, it has power, um, they're not going to be engaged. So it's really trying to find that motivation piece. Um, another comparison is that two-year-old. You know, the two-year-old, once they learn the word no, it's really powerful. And it's the same thing with these devices. If you kind of can recreate um, a similar experience with the device, something that's highly motivating, then you're going to get much more buy-in. All right, <clears throat> so modeling without expectation. Um, so I've already talked about this part, comparing the 10-year-old versus the baby and how our expectations change. So what do communication partners need to know about modeling on an AEC device? Um, it's similar to learning verbal language. Um, we wanna make it as natural as possible. So we wanna incorporate into activities that are already, being ha are already happening at home or in this classroom. It needs to be easy for you as the learner. So remember, the communication partner is everybody but the person using the device. So it's you guys, it's, it's, um, it's principals, the bus driver, paraprofessionals, um, siblings, the list goes on, okay? It's, it's everybody around that child. So let's look at the communication partner's role in language development. So when you look at a typically developing child, who do you think plays the biggest role in their language development? And there, there's no black or white answer with this. Um, I would say the most highly um, the frequently said answer is a parent, okay? But, it, you know, it could be guardian. It depends on that child and who's involved in their lives. But I would say for the most part, it's the parent. Okay, when you look at a child that is nonverbal, who's expected to play the biggest role in their language development? Again, no black or white answer. I've had um, people say teachers. I've had people say speech pathologists, um, parents. You know, there's a variety of answers. Uh, my experience, because I go out to the school districts all the time, I would say it's often the speech language pathologist. And it's simply because it's in their title. That's what they're supposed to be working on. And I've seen people give up responsibility of learning language to the speech pathologist um, for that reason. Uh, and it's not that, you know, it's not that it's wrong, it's just that we're not going to have the same success rate. So <clears throat> this is research by Jane Corston, and this is just to show what can happen when we give up responsibility to one person. The speech language pathologist often only sees um, 
that student or child once or twice a week, 20 to 30 minutes, especially in the school system. If they're seeing private therapy, that's usually 45 minutes to an hour, but again, only once a week. So <clears throat> what she found was that if we're gonna rely solely on the speech language pathologist, it's gonna take that person 84 years to get the same language exposure as it would from a parent from zero to 18 months, okay? So you can see the discrepancy. Um, and again, it's not, it's not to say that we're um, going to put all the responsibility on the parent and that none of it is going to be on the speech pathologist, just to really look at the data, okay? So when I, I started to think about this more several years ago, I broke it down, and so I thought, well, these are, these are approximations of what I typically see. So the speech language pathologist comes in about 30 minutes per week working with that child. Um, the teacher is around 1,500 minutes per week and the paraprofessional is 2,100 minutes per week, and then the parent is 4,200 minutes per week. And then you can see on the outer ring, rings, there's the peers and the siblings. So really, <clears throat> those four groups, peers, parent, paraprofessional, and siblings, are spending the most quantity of time with that child. So if they don't understand what it is they're supposed to be doing, then we're basically giving up all this opportunity to model in front of them um, and exposing that child to, to more success. <clears throat> All right, so if you already know the value of modeling, if you're an SLP, really think about does the team you're working with fully understand it? And the other piece is can they do it? One, you know, I've seen a lot of people that can actually define it, but when you watch them actually go to model, they get really um, confused and they feel overwhelmed. And I would say um, we don't want to set any guidelines for modeling. You know, if you're not doing it, then just start. So I often will say pick one word and make it a word that's high, highly used and on the main page of someone's file. So I is often on there, or you. So maybe start with I, and every time um, you, you, you're gonna verbalize the word I, you actually model it on the device. Because you're trying to model what you're thinking, not try to predict what that child is thinking, if that makes sense. We don't want people to be, um, um, modeling just around that child, like giving that child choices. We want you to come in from the weekend and say, hey, and on the device say, how are you? You know what I did this weekend? Um, I, I, you know, I went to the lake, it was so much fun. And you wanna be saying that on the communication device, right? It's a way to build relationships and it's a way to model really naturally. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna keep going, but if you have questions, please feel free to um, put them up there and Kim will uh, respond. Um, again, I'll have more time at the end where I can take take some time to answer questions. Okay, we're going to get into core vocabulary. <clears throat> so let's just break it down. I'm going to give my formal definition like I like to do. Um, so this is from David Buechelman. Um, so messages and words that are frequently used by many individuals across many contexts. This vocabulary typically consists of functor words such as is, was, he, she, and common nouns and primary verbs. So if you're an SLP, you've probably um, read the Buchelman and Miranda book, but if you're not, <clears throat> this is something you're not familiar with. So really, this doesn't make a lot of sense for those that are not in the field of speech language pathology or assistive technology. So let's break it down. So what this really means is there are 250 to 400 words that make up up to 85% of what we say as verbal communicators. So really that's a very small group of words that we say a lot of the time. So if you think about a dictionary, a 10,000 word dictionary, okay, that's a really small group of words. And if you think about, um, you think about a, a AEC device that you might have worked on, say it has 60 buttons on that page, right? You could get those core words within the first four pages. Right? And if you're saying those 85% of the time, then that makes up a lot of what we say. And we don't have to worry so much about kind of programming and getting every specific word down. Okay, so core words are also the same across gender. So whether you're male or female, your age, whether you're three or 80, it doesn't matter, the same words. Whether you're talking about football or math, it's the same. Whether you're at home or at school, these are the same words, and whether you have a disability. So let's look at what these words are. <clears throat> so we've got verbs like go and get, adjectives like big and little, um, prepositions like under and over, pronouns like I, my, and you, um, interjections like yes, no, and please, question words like what and where, adverbs like here and there. Okay, what class of words is actually missing here? <clears throat> okay, whoops, sorry. It is nouns. 
okay? So it's not that nouns are not important, it's just they don't make up these high frequency words that we, <clears throat> that we say all the time. They're not part of the core vocabulary. So I have another activity I want you to just try to um, complete these sentences, okay? So, oh, sorry, I'm going back and forth with my screen. Whoops, um, I've got a feeling we're not in blank anymore, Kansas. Here's looking at you, kid. Go ahead and make my day. Blank always said blank was like a blank of blank. You never know what you're going to get. So mama always said life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. So <clears throat> if we look at each of these blank um, words in each sentence, they're all nouns. Okay, so the, especially this top sentence. In this sentence, we have, um, if we break out the contractions, we've got 11 words and only one of them is actually a noun. We don't think about these small words like got and ah and we, not, in. Um, they don't have the same oomph as the content words, the noun-based words, right? But you can see how much we actually say that when, when you look at these sentences, okay? <clears throat> All right, fringe vocabulary. So that's kind of the opposite of core vocabulary. That's where your nouns are sitting. So fringe vocabulary is mostly nouns. Um, it's more specific than core vocabulary, and it's going to be different for different people. So if you're somebody who's into snowboarding, and then you have somebody that's in, into crocheting, those are two completely different hobbies or interests, and um, the vocabulary around them are going to be different. And then you can consider like elementary school. You know, one week um, kids are talking about fidget spinners uh, or Pokemon Go or LOL dolls, right? So it changes frequently. So I guess the point being that if you're going to try to stay on top of fringe vocabulary, it's going to be really tricky because it's so different for each person and our interests do change. Um, so that's where people get caught up and they end up programming the devices so much. Um, I'm going to skip this video, um, but here's what the, um, the video is a 30 second commercial. Uh, it's an old Super Bowl commercial, an M&M one, um, so you can read it if you like. But it's the value is really not in the commercial, although it's very funny. Um, but what we want to look at is, you know, a, a dialogue. So you could take, you could have recorded a conversation you had this morning with your family member or a coworker, okay, <clears throat> and then break it down. And what we're going to find is there's this 80-20 um, rule. So in this commercial, there's 57 words total. 11 of them are fringe and 46 are core. So it makes up, um, in this example, 81% for core and 19% for fringe, okay? Um, but this, these um, percentages are consistent. So if you would do that same um, recording of your own conversation with your family member, it's gonna come up really similar, give or take a couple percent, okay? And here's kind of some research to support this idea. Um, David Buchelman took 333 of the most frequently occurring preschool words. Um, the black ones are the core words and the red ones are the fringe. And what this shows us is that this 80-20 rule. Out of these 333 words, this is the 80-20 rule set up. So 80% are black or now are core and 20% are the red fringe words. All right, so <clears throat> this is a little bit of an aside, but an important piece. Um, so this uh, <clears throat> this study was done by Isabel Beck. Isabel Beck is a literacy expert. She doesn't have anything to do with the world of AAC. Um, so what Isabel Beck was trying to encourage was um, as kids came into kindergarten, she really wanted them to start working on these tier two set of words, these academic curriculum based words like rainforest and humidity, because her research showed that kids um, kids had tier one words, they had these core words as they entered into kindergarten. So why not just hit, hit them hard with the academic curriculum words and that will help build the vocabulary and make them more successful readers and spellers and that sort of thing. So what we know about kids that are nonverbal and actually kids that um, have English as a second language, <clears throat> they do not come into kindergarten with tier one words. They don't come in with wet, hot, dry, cold. Um, so think about the little um, boy we saw earlier, the 23-month-old eating the muffins. <clears throat> and so you can imagine, like, if he never used the word wet, hot, dry, cold, um, how would he be able to understand what rainforest and humidity meant? 
And this is what's happening for kids that are on AEC devices. They may, maybe they do understand those words, but they don't know where they are on their communication systems. And when people are talking to them, they don't ever use the communication systems to show them the words. So it's almost like this developmental leap we're expecting these nonverbal kids that already have challenges of their own um, to skip over and start talking about rainforest and humidity when they don't have those words to describe them. So when you see it in these terms, it really, um, it starts to hit home a little bit about what's kind of missing for these nonverbal individuals. <clears throat> so core vocabulary is really that lowest common denominator of language. So again, back to the little boy eating the muffins, he might say big thing outside. And maybe you say, oh, the tree, to clarify. And he says, no. And then you said, oh, the flagpole? Yeah. Um, and so that core or co lowest common denominator of language allows him to get out and, and circumlocute words that may not be in um, available to him. He doesn't understand them or know what they are. Same thing with communication devices. If kids have communication devices and they have those core words, they can actually communicate what they're really intending without having that specific noun-based word. And that's really part of the early language development, as we saw with um, that little boy in the beginning. That's often how kids do it. Not to say they don't ever learn nouns. Nouns can be really engaging, especially if it's something they're very interested in, but um, a lot of those core words serve the purpose um, for them early on, and they need it to go further. So core vocabulary can be used in multiple situations, whether you're playing with Play-Doh, Legos, you're talking about stories or doing academics or social. The core vocabulary can be used with, um, be generalized through all those situations. So that's the other pieces. You know, if you learn words like um, wall, ceiling, you know, floor, light, um, that's not going to help you in multiple situations. It will help you request those specific items, but it doesn't let you talk about them. All right, so why are we gonna teach core? <clears throat> um, I'm gonna actually kind of fly through this part because I know I'm, uh, of course, getting low on time as usual. Um, I really want to kind of draw your eye down to the part where core supports literacy, whoops, um, and it overlaps with academic vocabulary. Okay, and we're gonna get into that um, in, a, in a sec. Um, so again, if you already know the value of core, so if you're an SLP and you really get that, does the team you're working with really understand it? And if they don't understand it, that's a really important piece because they won't be on the same page with you if they don't if they don't really get it. Um, and they need it broken down to them in, in layman's terms, not in speech terms. Okay, again, feel free to throw in some questions there to, to Kim and I'm gonna keep flying by. Um, so how are core words going to support literacy? So if, I'm gonna show you another definition. Uh, so if you kind of bring your eyes down to that yellow part, uh, I really want to look at sight words, okay? So this is a definition, but this is the part that really kind of drew me in. Sight words account for a large percentage, up to 75% of the words used in beginning children's print material. So when we look at core ver words versus sight words, they're both um, small groups of words that are used a lot of the time, so high percentages. So what does that look like? So if we really break it down. So I took, um, um, I was just intrigued with our product, our own products. And so I took Fry's top 100 sight words. Sometimes Dolch is used and sometimes a combination. But these are the top 100 sight words that are used in elementary school in the beginning. And I took one of our word power files, word power 60, and all the words circled in red are actually sight words that are on that top 100 page. And 50% of that first page of word power actually has sight words. So many times when we're talking about core words, we're also talking about sight words. And I tell you, that is the buy-in for teachers because they don't know anything about core words and they don't really care about core words because their goals are academic based. So if you can throw in um, the sight words part, then all of a sudden you're gonna have much more interest in your classroom team because they have all these IEP goals they're trying to meet and the sight words really are where um, the curriculum is, not in the core words. So just to kind of summarize, modeling really teaches the early steps of both communication and literacy. It's all intertwined. Okay. Again, feel free to ask questions. I'll just keep going. So the structure of word power. So word power files are kind of our most effective solution. Um, they're our most robust file um, in, in the touch chat and the Nova chat, chat fusion products. And the reason being they allow you to model easily. So you as the verbal communicator, you can use the, 
the files fairly easily. Um, they provide the core language that we've just seen is really critical for communication and they're organized. They're already set up in an organized way. So where is the core language and how is it organized? So let's just take a quick peek. Um, so if you look on the left, we've got, um, this is kind of a modified Fitzgerald key, and I'm not going to go into details about that, but it's, you know, it's a color coding system if you're not familiar with it, and you can Google it to find out more. Um, but you can see here, really, yellow is set up for pronouns, like I and you and it. So you'll notice on this word power file, we have seven of the most frequently used um, pronouns. They're all in yellow, okay? Um, oops. And um, so if, if the pronoun I'm looking for is actually not there, it happens to be something else, where do you think I would go? So based on color coding and the fact that we're talking about pronouns. So the answer is, and I know the color isn't quite exactly the same, but it's people, all right? So people is a lighter shade of yellow and it brings up more pronouns. And this would be a place where you would have maybe a button though for academic people. So for, again, for those school teams, if you're talking about, if they're trying to teach Martin Luther King, George Washington, they could have an academic people page. So anything to do with a person is gonna be under here. Okay, so the next one is, um, is verbs. So those are in green. So we have the top 24 most frequently used verbs. Okay, and you'll notice on the left, we have a lighter shade of green. Um, and those are helping verbs, that's why they're color-coded that way. You can also see they're alphabetized within each category. So be, come, eat, drink, finish, go, get, help. The helping verbs aren't in that alphabetization. But this is, it helps you as a communication partner find those verbs. So if the verb I'm looking for is not there, where am I gonna go? So the answer is um, actions, action words. So you hit actions and it brings up a whole other 60 um, verbs. Um, there's also another arrow over over on the right there that will take you to the next page uh, verbs and there's also an actions A to Z which is all the verbs are alphabetized under each letter so if you go into actions A to Z and hit the letter A it'll give you all the verbs that start with the letter A. Okay I'm going to skip through so the pattern kind of goes on we've got little words that are in blue and you'd hit the um, any, every, but, or, or, the little word button, it's a similar color, and it's also made up of a bunch of little words. Um, and and then we've got adjectives under describing. So hopefully that helps um, kind of guide you a little bit more. Question words are all under questions, social phrases. Um, anyway, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so another piece I really... Um, like to go over is just how many buttons you have in a system um, and you know often I'll go into a school and for whatever reason multi-chat 15 um, a 15 button file is kind of the go-to for a lot of school teams um, and so I always like to bring this up and I ask people would you rather text on a flip phone or a smartphone all right um, and most of the time I would say people say a smartphone so then uh, we talk a lot about you know how many times would it take you to get to the letter C uh, on a flip phone so the answer is three. So this is similar to what happens on a communication device. If we only have 15 buttons on a page, that, that child is gonna have to go much deeper. It's gonna, they're gonna get much more lost in the system and it's actually more of a cognitive load. It's more complicated for them to do this. You know, ask them to use a flip phone versus a smartphone. And, and, and that seems to really, that analogy seems to really help people understand why you might wanna have more buttons. It's not to say that every child fits into that category. If you have a child that has motor or visual issues, then you might, you know, you're gonna need to consider having bigger buttons and less of them. But for the most part, if you can get away with the most buttons possible, um, that will help your child. And they can handle it much more than we think. It's usually the adults that are overwhelmed by the number of buttons. So the best way to teach the structure of word power is very similar to modeling. We wanna work with each communication partner's level of comfort. So if you have a paraprofessional that's really not comfortable, um, we wanna gradually integrate um, an easy way for them to do this. And um, Maybe it's incorporating the modeling piece and having them model um, one word a week. Um, and you, so you make it gradual. Um, and then providing structured activities for the team as well, which we're going to talk about with the literacy. Okay. So literacy in the classroom. Um, so this is a commonly used research paper. Um, Karen Erickson out of Chapel Hill uses it quite a bit, uh, as does Caroline Musselwhite, Gretchen Hanser. Um, and it's, it is really cool to see. So really the point is to show that, um, sorry, my voice is going. 
sorry, my cold's catching up with me. Um, all right, so uh, receptive communication and expressive communication are often the focal points for kids that are nonverbal, which is understandable. The expressive part is usually um, where the weakness is, so we want to work on that. But what ends up happening is reading and writing get overlooked, and that's really what this research shows. So, um, so what Copenhaver, Coleman, Coleman, and Yoder showed was um, expressive and receptive communication, reading, writing are all intertwined. So kids are doing it at an early age. 12 months old are picking up those big chunky crayons and hitting them on the wall, drawing on the wall, right? Um, children with severe speech impairments are often not considered good candidates for literacy. And many children using AEC devices do not have a mu uh, much exposure to either reading or writing. And as they move through primary school without these skills, each new year puts them at a significant disadvantage to their peers. So it's really important to start this early. So when we look at most children, typical ch children, are they read to by someone, parent, teacher, SLP, etc.? cetera? Um, and I always get kind of a mixed answer when I'm live, but to me, you know, if the parents aren't reading at home, then we know the teachers usually are. Um, it's built into the curriculum. That's really what it comes down to, right? Reading is so important that it's to it's already integrated, and we don't even think about it in our in our school system, right? Um, reading logs, you know, parents, uh, kids come home with reading logs from preschool on, and they have to document how much they're reading because the research shows the more you read, the more successful you are. Um, and these are some of the reasons why their uh, reading is important or books are important. It expands a child's vocabulary, it stimulates their imagination, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, and this is just an illustration of what shared reading is like. So if you're not in the elementary setting, um, then this is just to kind of remind you what happens. So the teacher usually starts the story off in the beginning of the week and starts reading. And then um, the first time around, the kids are just watching, and then the next day they read it, and some of the kids start chiming in, and and by the end of the week, a lot of the kids are reading along, and they're re it's really fun for them, and they are able to participate. So they they probably memorize the book, and they're able to read it through memorization. So that's kind of the early stage of shared reading. So these are some of the benefits of reading. It, they kids can actively participate in reading. They learn to predict how a story will progress. They understand that illustrations can help construct meaning. The list goes on. So then here's what happens with kids that are nonverbal. You can automatically cross out actively participate in reading, increase and develop new vocabulary, discover and implement reading strategies, recognize letters and sounds. Because it comes back to we're not speaking, they're not, we're not reading in the same language. This is a teacher getting up and reading verbally to these kids. And it's not that it's bad for them, but they don't get the same benefit out of it that typical kids do. So I'm going to show you a video um, of a 21-month-old and her mom is reading to her. So this is just to show you what it looks like when you read to a child on a communication device. So the mom is the one, for the most part, using the communication device. Yeah. Mommy wants to read you a book. Can we read our book? Can we read? Can we read a book? Can we read a book? Oh, what's this book about? So bugs? Is it about animals? Oh, here, look. I see a kitten, a little kitty cat, and a dog. That's right, look. That's a doggy. Dog. That's a doggy. Frog. A frog. Fish. And a fish. Where's the fish? Here. Where's the fish? I don't know. <gasps> there it is. There it is. The fishy. I see a fish. Oh, pet. Can you pet the fish? Zoe pet. pet. Can you pet the fish? Pet. Oh yeah, pet. pet that. How about pet, pet. the fish? Pet. Pet. pet the fish. Yeah. Fish. Pet. Okay, so you can see um, you know, it's obviously a very short book, but because it, there's only one um, word on each page, it really simplifies it for the mom, so she can actually um, read re quite easily um, 
that particular book. You can imagine if it was a longer book, but but you actually need to use a communication device because otherwise that child has no way to express themselves. They're not learning the vocabulary. They're not learning how to read it. Um, and it's the same with communication. We need to model. <clears throat> so this next video is a really cool one. Sarah Fisher, she actually has a recorded guest webinar on our website, so I encourage you to watch it. She's a special ed teacher here in, in Northern Colorado. Um, so what you're going to see here, Sarah has eight kids that come into her class every morning and they do a half an hour of reading. She does a repetitive phrase book, so something like, I see the blank, I see the, you know, whatever, that kind of thing. So there are two kids in the class that actually use communication devices. The other six have receptive language issues, um, but they all um, take a turn and they and they, she reads one page on the smart board. So this is our chat editor software. She reads the the page and then each of them has a chance to come up and read a page. So you'll get to see Sarah read and then you'll get to see one of her students come up who uses a communication device. The fox jumps over. Watch me first. first. You ready, Lil? Are your eyes on me? The, eyes on me because fox is kind of tricky on some of your devices. The yellow fox. While some of you have to go to the next page. Fox. What am I listening for at the beginning? What letters that the What letters that nice? I'm listening for an F. The fox jumps over. Nice job. Oh, I almost forgot my period. The fox jumps over. Your turn. Connor, you want to write it up here again? Yeah. All right, go for it, friend. Ready? makes it look nice and easy um, and you can see you know what happens there with you know Connor is able to pluralize and add punctuation and um, generate that sentence um, and then to watch every kid get up there and, and model for the other kids it's, it's truly amazing so um, like I said you can <clears throat> you can see Sarah on the on our website so the question is how would how would you would you feel comfortable doing that you know if you're um, for most teachers they do feel comfortable getting up in front of their class in that classroom management situation, but they don't understand the vocabulary files. So Sarah really took it upon herself to learn those, and it really made a huge difference. Um, but I would say a beginning step would be to do more, more of that one-on-one, -on -one. get the paraprofessional involved, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going over. Uh, I'm sorry. I apologize to anyone that can't stay on, um, but I'll just keep going, um, unless Kim lets me know otherwise. <laughs> Okay, so the communication partner's role must be simplified so that the communication partner is more comfortable modeling to the student. That's really what it comes down to. Most of the paraprofessionals and teachers, they don't really feel comfortable in their skills and modeling, and oftentimes they don't have time. So I really like to rely on, you know, if there's a one-on-one -on -one paraprofessional or try to get peers or um, peers involved, either in the classroom or, or peer mentoring. Um, and so this whole idea came about when I met with Gretchen Storm, who's a 
<clears throat> SLP at one of the schools here in Colorado. Um, so what happened with Gretchen was I knew she had about five kids that were finishing up first grade. So several years ago, I went out to, to meet with her just to find out how those five kids were doing in first grade because I knew first grade was all about reading and writing. Um, and so I, I wanted to find out what she was doing. So um, she basically said to me, all five of these kids are reading. And I found that really striking because um, I'd been doing this for so long and I'd never really met first graders that were nonverbal that were reading. So I asked her to break it down and tell me what she had done. And so she pulls out a book that looks like this. Um, and knowing what I know about first graders, I thought this is way too simple. They're reading at a much higher level than this. And she said, well, you're right, they are, but this is not about the first grader. This is about the people around them, the communication partners, the, the paraprofessionals, the teachers. They're, she said they're so overwhelmed by um, the device that they're not reading. And when you provide a book with too many words, then they can't read it either because they're spending all their time looking for the word in the device. So she said by just providing one single word, um, it made them much more successful. So this is one of the books that she had. It was like an opposites book, and that's in one of your handouts. Um, so you can see here that once you learn where adjectives are, so if you go to describe, the word big comes up, and then you go to describe, and the word small comes up. So all of a sudden, you have start, starting to get a pattern. So what ended up happening, um, the paraprofessionals were the ones that were, they had a hard copy book, and they had a device, and they were asked to go read to the students. And they'd come back after a couple of weeks, and they said, wow, you know, this symbol's in this book, and I'm starting to feel much more comfortable. So then she was able to grow to, like, um, two word phrases <clears throat> so she she had she did develop two word phrase books but you don't have to they're already built into the curriculum in elementary school so you can go get those um, but but she does do things like um, after winter break after summer break after spring break um, she asks, asks parents to send in pictures and they write they actually write the story together the, her and the student and then the book gets put into the library and it can get, be taken home and uh, people can read it all the time so it's really cool. So this is one of the stories. One of her kids um, went to football camp, really cool, Broncos camp for the summer. And so Jake wanted to write about it. So they, they wrote it. You can see here that there's a lot more text than there is in the pathway. So all the pathway really gets you on the device is football camp, but it's still something. And it, you can see it's the number of buttons to hit to get football camp. Um, but you can still put text in that doesn't necessarily match um, the person could still follow this pathway. So a lot of people assume that this pathway is for the student. It's not. It's for that communication partner so they can model. I would say the kids pick it up really quickly as long as someone is modeling and they're engaged in the book. If their head is in the device and they're terrified, they, um, they're going to lose their um, student. The student's going to be like, okay, you're not even reading to me. All you're doing is looking for a word in the, in the device. So you really want to make it about, about the book, just like that mom did um, in that one-on-one -on -one reading video. Um, so this is just to show if you're in an elementary school setting, um, these repetitive phrase books are in there. You know, you can start with single words or no words even and, and build your way up. But once people learn where we and can is after reading it 10, 12 times in a repetitive phrase book, then they've got it and they've got those core words. Now, eat and play, they're only said once, but um, we don't care about that. If they learn where we and can is, then um, that's a huge accomplishment. And then this is an example of um, if you do pick a book that has more text, you, you know, look at all those words and think about somebody trying to find a pathway to get to all those words, how overwhelming that would be. So this is a way to modify it. So this, this is what Gretchen did, where you can say the child is sleeping, and then this actually Velcros out, and you can say the granny's sleeping, the mouse is sleeping, that sort of thing. But I would really say start more, more simply, start with those single word pages because you're otherwise you're going to lose your your um, parents you're going to lose your um, uh, paraprofessionals and you're going to lose your teachers okay we're, we're making it way too complicated uh, for people to learn the process so the purpose of the shared reading is really to teach the communication the parent the teacher the para the SLP how to easily model and it also provides an opportunity to teach students vocabulary and location on their devices all right so what did Gretchen do? She really put the focus on the communication partner, not the student. And she simplified the process um, by providing those really easy books with the pathway. And she, and she used shared reading, which is something that's already built into the academic curriculum. So that was the piece that, that ties in there. Teachers are going to buy into that because that's what their students are supposed to be doing anyways. So why not jump on board with that? Um, <clears throat> and then she also provided structured activities for errorless learning. Now, I'm not going to get into 
too many details, but I did provide the links to Gretchen's um, Teacher Pay Teacher site as well as um, her own website. Okay. <clears throat> Um, okay, so this is just, I'm going to whip through this tools for increasing literacy. It's really just important to know that we have this chat editor software, it's free. Um, now you don't have the speech output unless you are, um, get a CD, so you'd have to um, request one from your local consultant. Um, but what the chat editor does, it allows you to use the, the software on a smart board or Promethean board, so it actually can act as a device, which is really helpful. And then there's also a capture feature on the software that allows you to create those books that you saw. So it doesn't work on Mac, it only works on Windows, unfortunately, right now. Um, and so the capture feature looks like this. When you when you load it onto your PC, um, this sits on your, on your desktop, uh, the icon sits on your desktop and you open it up and there's this capture button here circled in red. When you click on that, it opens a box on the bottom, and then whatever you type into that vocabulary file, it puts the symbol below. And then you can do um, copy to clipboard um, right there, and then you can insert it into a Word document, a PowerPoint. Uh, if you're familiar with Tar Heel Reader Books, I've provided the link, but if, you're, um, if you are already familiar, um, those are all PowerPoint books, and you can insert the pathway in all those books. So basically, Tar Heel Reader is a plethora of books available that, that cover um, curriculum that you can just type in a keyword and, and get information. So whether it's Solar System or Martin Luther King, they'll, you'll get a bunch of books that come up that people have developed, and it's free. Um, so, so this is just an example, uh, you know, another example of a book you can make. So really the literacy tips are create a loan library. So Gretchen, as she started to kind of progress within this plan that she was doing, the books that she made, she actually kept in a big box and every week, um, kids would come in that were nonverbal and they'd sign them out for the week. So you know, just like they go to the library, they'd come to her library. And what happened is the parents now had a way to easily reach their child on the device because the pathway came along with it. So it wasn't just they were asked to read on the device and they were totally overwhelmed. Now they had a, a way to do it. So like every other kid in elementary school, their parents are reading to them every night or hopefully. Um, and that's what's happening. It also allowed the paraprofessionals. That's what she did, bringing the paras in to read one-on-one, -on -one, especially when there was downtime. And then most schools have a peer reading buddy. So whether it's fifth graders coming into first grade and helping them, or um, first graders teaming up with uh, another first grader and working together to read to help, um, this can be done with nonverbal and verbal kids. So they use the communication device. And I tell you, kids pick up the devices really easily. Um, and there's a whole research um, at Maureen Castillo, um, again, another guest webinar, um, a SWAT coordinator out of Colorado um, did a research and she showed um, results of kindergarten, first grade with this peer reading buddies and showed they all improved. Um, and the, the half the kids were nonverbal and the other were verbal. So just to summarize, um, really, start using the AC device to talk. Get everyone you can talking. We want to bump up the quantity of time people are talking to those nonverbal kids with their device, okay? Just like a baby. Um, core vocabulary, the whole team needs to understand what the value of core vocabulary is. So they're not trying to program a bunch of noun or nouns in there um, instead of working on those core words. Um, you need to learn and teach word power. If they don't understand those files that they're working on, then they're not gonna be able to model. Um, and finally, reading is an activity that will make you more comfortable using the AC device to talk, and it's really critical for that student's academic success. Reading and writing are the building blocks to academic success, so we need to be focusing on those. All right, well, if there's no questions, I'll just, um, here's my email address. I'm more than happy to address any questions um, through email. Um, if you have any questions about the vocabulary files, I'm happy to answer those as well. Um, oh. Okay, so the, sorry, a question came in. Should we stop modeling in AAC when child learns all pathways? Um, honestly, I have met very few kids that um, have 100% uh, uh, been able to figure out their vocabulary file. There are a couple, we have a couple um, ambassadors here in Colorado that are basically they're literate, so they're using their device to spell. And that that's to me um, kind of writing would be the, ultimate way for them to use their communication device. So um, um, for those uh, individuals, they actually don't require anyone to model, although um, I think they would 
ask their parents to help them with spelling possibly, although they can use um, those spelling um, word prediction, that sort of thing. Um, so are you able to send the slide that shows percentage of words that are core words and the one that shows exposure to or time with parents and para? Um, we don't, I can share those uh, single slides um, definitely. So I, I don't know, Kim, what the best way to do that. We can't share the entire slideshow, um, but I'm happy to share those slides as long as you um, credit Sotillo with them. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. And um, let us know if you have any further questions.